All right, we're picking up on page 15, at the very bottom of 15, moving on with our discussion of derived units. And if you remember yesterday, I talked about derived units as, at times they become kind of like Twilight Zone-ish. Okay, they, they have values that we're not really used to considering. And yesterday I think I used a, a, a meter liter, for example, as a unit. And we don't usually work in meter liters, but I wanted you to get this idea that it, there is a possibility that you could have a unit of a meter of a meter liter, even though you've never heard of it before. It could be valid if that is the units that are derived from the math. And so what we're going to do is pick up at the bottom of 15 and follow on with this idea of derived units, remembering that up to this point in mathematics, you've used the coefficients. You've, you've used numbers to figure out things. But now, as we move into chemistry and in physics, and I mentioned just a moment ago that the physics class is actually doing this same exact segment in their class. The seniors, now hopefully they had it with me last year in chemistry, and so I told Mr. Parker, I mean, they should just say, okay, factor label method, what's that? Oh, that's where you come up with a conversion factor with the, oh, yeah, we did that last year. It should be pretty straightforward to them, as it will be to you, you know, a little bit downstream from here. But hopefully it will make sense. And we're going to start with just basic algebra, in terms of the coefficients, in terms of the math. In the book, they use this, this example. If we looked at 1.1 times 2.0, in math, you would come back and say, well, the answer to that is 2.2. Now, hopefully, we don't have to go into a discussion of why that's true, right? Basic algebra, or not even algebra, basic mathematics. So 1.1 times 2 is equal to 2.2. On top of page 16, they extend that conversation a little bit farther and say, well, if you were using algebra, and you wrote down that 1.1x times, and I'll use this notation for multiplication, times 2.0 would equal what? This would equal 2.2x. If I had 1.1x times 2.0x, I would have 2.2 x squared. Okay? Now, for our purposes, let's go ahead and extend this, and rather than using x, let's consider units. If rather than x, let's say we had inches, and I made this equation to be 1.1 inches times 2.0, what would I now have? The math, the coefficient would be the same, right? I've got 2 times 1.1 inches. My answer would be 2.2, looking at the coefficients. And my units would be inches. Right? If I said to you, go over there and pick up that 1.1 inch stick, take two of them, put them together, how long is it? It's 2.2 inches long. 2 of 1.1 inches is 2.2 inches. Here's where it gets a little bit <clears throat> different, is if rather than 1.1 inches times 2, I had 1.1 inches times 2.0 inches. So you do the coefficients. 1.1 times 2, we've already done that up here, is 2.2. But now when we look at the units, we have inches times inches. And just the same way we had x times x is x squared, we're going to have inches times inches is inches squared. All right. Extend it one more time. 1.1x times 2.0x times x Now, in here, you've got an implied 1, right? x is 1x. The coefficient in front of the x is a 1. It's not a 0. It's a 1. But we don't write the 1. So 1.1x times 2x would be 2.2x squared times x would make this now 2.2x cubed. In the same way, 1.1 inches times 2.0 inches times in this case, I would write 1 inch equals 2.2 inches 
cubed. All right. So conceptually, I mean, if you don't follow the concept, you at least see the math. We're going to treat the units as, as, as if they actually have value in the math. You can't simply ignore the units. Having the units is important. It's significant. All right? You can't disregard the units because if I were to do something crazy like I did yesterday and say we have a meter liter, meaning I multiplied some value of meters, some distance unit, times a volume unit, which is a liter, and it came up with meter liters, I could use that value later on in the problem, if it's true, to continue to solve the problem. Let's say that I had meter liters and I wanted to solve for liters, then I would know I'd have to divide by meters and end up with liters. You know, look at the units that I have, just as we did before, look at the units that I have, look at the units that I want to end with, and then figure out what I need to do to get to those units. That'll help me in the setup of the problem. And speaking of the setup of the problem, a student asked me yesterday, one of your peers asked, how do you know when to, like when, when we're doing um, scientific notation, how do you know when to multiply by a thousand or how do you know when to divide by a thousand? That's all going to come back to how did you set up your statement of equality? What something equals something else. And then when you set it up with your units, you just bring those numbers over into the equation. Sometimes it's going to be in the numerator. Sometimes you're going to multiply a number by a thousand. Sometimes you're going to divide the number by a thousand. I can't tell you when it's going to be which. It's all going to be based upon the problem that you're actually working. So any issues with this concept here? If I said over here, in, in terms of these units, if I'm looking at a, dis at a uh, unit that is in inches, what am I looking at? If it's inches, it refers to, what do we call that? Length, distance, right? Inches is distance. If I'm looking at inches squared, what do we call that? What is, the, what is the general term we use for a value which is a square of distance? If I were to say, what is the length of this page? Let's say it's just a, a normal piece of typing paper or computer paper. What is, the, what is the length of the page? You come back and say, it's 11 inches. If I said, what is the width of the page? You come back and say, it's eight and a half inches, right? Those are both units of length that are in inches. If I said, this piece of paper right here is 92 square inches. What is square inches? It's a unit of surface area, the surface area. If this were an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, this side of the book, it would be 11 inches long and eight and a half inches wide. And if I multiply its length times its width, I would come up with the surface area. How much paper am I looking at when I'm looking at that page? You could say you're looking at 11 inches of paper. Is it 11 inches by two miles? How, well, it's 11 by eight and a half. Another way of saying 11 by eight and a half is 92 square inches. Because if this is 11 by eight and a half, and I do this, and now it's eight and a half by 11, guess what? It's still the same amount of paper. It's just oriented a little bit differently. And I can make it longer or shorter. Like when you go to buy material to make clothing, when you go to buy material to side a house, whenever you go to buy material, you don't buy it by just its length. I need to buy shingles for the roof. How what, what kind do you want? I mean, give me 42 inch shingles. Okay, 42 inch shingles. How many do you want? I don't have any idea. Why? I just know how long they are. How big is the roof? I don't know. It's like 40 feet long. Okay. Well, we need to figure out a way to buy enough shingle based upon its application to cover that much roof. How do you figure it out? Well, you're going to take the width of the roof, the depth of the roof, multiply those together, come up with the square footage, the area of the roof, and then buy enough shingles to cover that much square footage. Down here we've got cubed, right? Distance cubed. Using the same analogy of my book, I could tell you that the page is 11 and a half, or excuse me, 11 inches long, or eight and a half inches wide. It may have a surface area. I did the math real quickly in my head, but I think it's 92 square inches. 
But if I'm asking about inches cubed, what am I looking at? Well, now I'm looking at, pardon? Go ahead. Well, surface area is square, right? So I've got surface area times inches, right? The surface area times the inches, and I'm looking at the volume. Now I'm looking at, okay, this book, it's 11 by 8.5 by an inch and a half, maybe. So now I'm looking at how much volume does this book take up? How much space does it occupy in our environment? Because it's inches times inches times inches. So going from a length distance to an area distance to a volume value are the three different things. When we're measuring the length of a, of a page, let's say we're measuring that piece of paper, what instrument would you use to measure that paper? Probably. What, what tool would you use to be able to measure the length of a piece of paper? A ruler, right? Just take a 12-inch ruler. It's, it's, it's longer than your, what you're measuring. Throw it up against that and say, hey, I've got a 12-inch ruler. This page is 11 inches long. Hey, I've got a 12-inch ruler, and this page is 8.5 inches wide. How do you measure the surface area? How do you measure what the length times the width is? We use the same thing. You take the ruler, right? You make the two measurements, and then you do the math. You just multiply the length times the width, and you'll come up with a number that represents the surface area. Now, how do you, do, how do you find the volume? Well, you could do the same thing. You can measure the length of the page, the width of the page, and then measure the depth of the book. Those three units all together are going to give you a volume measurement. The units are going to be cubed. They're going to be a distance cubed. And that cube lets you know you're talking about volume. Remember we had the balloon, and I said as I blew it up, it increased in volume. Its size got bigger. Well, the volume is how much space does that balloon occupy. In the same way, this book, and we're, we're not fish, so we recognize that there's air all around us, right? But this book right now is displacing a certain amount of air. Air can't be in there. Why? Because the book is there. How much space is this book taking up? How much air is this book displacing? Well, we can measure it. This times this times this. And come back and tell me how many cubic inches of space this book occupies. One of the other really neat things about volume is we can take a, remember the first day I had that large beaker and I uh, submerged the smaller beaker into it, put my hand in it, and you saw the volume go up? One of the really neat things about this is I could also take a large volume of water, measure its volume, then drop the book into the water. Don't do this at home because we need to collect these from you. Okay, but drop the book in the water and the value on the, on the beaker, that line would go up. It would say, hey, before I had so many liters of water, now I've got a different number of liters of water. How much did it go up? You would measure that and say, this book is what caused the measurement to increase, the line to raise. How much did it raise? Just throw out a number. Let's just say it rose one liter. What's the volume of the book? One liter. How do you know? Because it went into the water displaced the water, the water had to go somewhere, and it rose up in that column. So now I can say the volume of the book is equal to the volume of the same volume of water that it displaced when I dropped it into the beaker, into the measuring device. Let me get one out here. Just so we can just so we can see it again. So if I were to take a beaker, put water into it, let's say it filled up to the four hundred milliliter line right here, fill up the 400 milliliter line, take an object, drop it in there, and when I drop it in, if the volume goes up to the 500 milliliter line, then what's the volume of the object that I dropped into it? 100 milliliters. It'll raise up equal to the volume of the thing that I placed in it. That'll indicate why the change was made. Okay, Getting a little bit away from the core issue of derived um, units, but it's important, you know, for our discussion as we move on. Let's go back to just this core issue then of derived units. One of the ways that you've probably struggled in the past, or I'm sure everyone's made mistakes because I still, I have and I still do make this mistake, 
is when we're converting between units. If I said, for example, in the book they give you, they work through an example where you're converting from centimeters to meters. And we said before that if I were given a certain number, in the book the example is 5.208. Let's say that we had 5.208 centimeters. I know the book uses a slightly different, but let's start with this. 2.58 centimeters. And I wanted to convert that, so I know I'm going to have another unit conversion factor. I want to convert that into a unit of meters. So I need so many meters. Knowing that I need to use a co unit conversion factor from centimeters to meters, I need a statement of equality that converts from centimeters to meters, that relates centimeters to meters, right? So what is a true statement about the relationship between centimeters and meters? Since I'm going from centimeters to meters, I need something about meters equals so many centimeters. So my true statement is going to be what? Let's, let's turn it around. One meter is equal to 100 centimeters. There are 100 centimeters in a meter. So now I have a statement that is true, and I know that I need a statement that's true that relates centimeters to meters in some way. Does it? Yes, it does. I'm going to look back over here now and say, okay, I'm converting from centimeters to meters, so I need to have some unit of centimeters in the denominator and some number of meters in the numerator. Why? Because I'm going to centimeters are going to cancel centimeters and I'm going to be left with meters. Now this relates to the question that your peer asked yesterday. How do I know where to put what? I look over to my statement of equality and I see that the one meter, which is going to go here, because it's looking for something that relates meters, that's my meters, to centimeters. going to go in there. That's why I know it's times 1 over 100, not times 100 over 1. Why? The meters relates to the meters. The centimeters comes from my centimeters here. So it's going to be 1 over 100. Now the math, because it's base 10, dividing by 100, I'm going to move the decimal two places to the left because I'm dividing by 100, two zeros, two places to the left. One, two, so I'm going to need a, need to add to the front there, meaning I'm going to have 0 0.05208 meters. Well, that should make sense. It should make sense that when I have five, and then divide by 100, I'm going to have five hundredths, right? That's what this is, five in the hundredths place. So 5 divided by 100 is 5 hundredths. I look at that and, okay, that's reasonable. Now here's where the difficulty comes. This should have been relatively straightforward. Let me erase all this directional diagram here. Make some room so it's not quite so confusing. To end up with units of meters from centimeters, I multiply by a conversion factor of 1 meter is equal to 100 centimeters. But the book gives the example of if I'm trying to convert from 5.208 centimeters cubed to a certain number of meters cubed. How am I going to convert from centimeters cubed to meters cubed? Well, I have a statement of equality already written down over here, right? That one meter is equal to 100 centimeters. So let me start by applying what I know. I know 1 to 100 is the relationship there. Let me erase this because we're going to need more space. But let me start working across knowing that I'm trying to end up in cubic meters, not cubic centimeters. I know that if I convert this by going 1 meter is equal to 100 centimeters, What are my units going to be if I did this math right now? What would my units be? 
let's look at let's look at the units part. I'm just going to carry the units. I'm not going to do the coefficient math, right? Let me look at this. I've got centimeters cubed times meters divided by centimeters. Let's simplify that. What is centimeters cubed times meters divided by centimeters? Maybe make it a little bit easier for you, relating something you've seen before. Let's say if I had x cubed y divided by x. Simplify that. x cubed times y divided by x. Equals x squared y. Okay? The x cancels one of these x's, right? I mean, if it was just x, we would go x cancels x and we're left with y. In this case, we had x to the third. We're going to, this x changes this to a square, and now we've got x squared y. In the same way, over here, if I've got cubic centimeters times meters divided by centimeters, this centimeter cancels one of these, not all three of them, makes it centimeters squared times meters. Am I looking for centimeters squared meters? No, I'm looking for meters cubed. So we're part of the way there. What we end up needing to do, again, make more space. This gets rid of one of my centimeters. I need to keep going. Because if I do it again, now what are my units going to be? Well, this canceled one of them. This is going to cancel one more. And raised to the first power is the same as itself. We're not going to write that down. So we're still left with centimeters over our units now look like centimeters, meters squared. The math here would be centimeters, meters squared. That's not what we're looking for either, but we're closer. Remember before it was, it was meters, centimeters squared. Now it's centimeters, meters squared. Let's do it one more time. If we multiply it by one meter over 100 centimeters one more time, you can see that centimeters cancels my last remaining centimeters, and my units... If I look across, all I have left is meters times meters times meters, or meters cubed. Now my units are right. Now I can do the coefficient math. 5.208 divided by 2. I'm going to move it 6 to the left, right? I've got 2 times 2 times 2, or excuse me, 2 and 2 and 2. That's going to give me 6. So when I come up here, I've got to move this to the left six places. Let me add a bunch of zeros just to keep my places right. One, two, three, four, five, six. So 5.208 centimeters cubed is the same as 0 0.00005208 meters cubed. And good, that's the book agrees with me on page 17. So they've walked you through that whole thing. But using this idea of converting from centimeters cubed to meters cubed, it's a derived unit, and you've got to do it, you've got to convert it three times in order to keep the unit straight. If I just converted it one time, I would have centimeters squared times meters. If I do it a second time, I've got centimeters times meters squared. If I do it a third time, I have meters cubed. And meters cubed is a volume, cubic meters. If you see in the middle of page 17, they make this statement that one cubic centimeter is the same as one milliliter. You're going to use this relationship repeatedly. You need to have this memorized. Okay? That one cubic centimeter is one milliliter. You may see a cubic, let me write it this way, one milliliter is equal to one cubic centimeter. You may also see it written this way. Another abbreviation sometimes used for a cubic centimeter is a cc, one cubic centimeter. So a milliliter is a cubic centimeter, and the cubic centimeter could be written one cm cubed or one 
cc. Again, on the, you may have see, heard that on TV, give them five cc's of, well, five cc's, give them five cubic centimeters. Oh, that's a milliliter. Give them five milliliters, the same thing. Would you pick up a graduated cylinder, for example? This, is, this device is known as a graduated cylinder. We'll be using this and actually passing them around just a minute. Let me get a cleaner one here, a smaller one even. So this has 25 milliliters as its maximum measurable volume. 25 milliliters. So from the bottom to the top, it's 25 milliliters. Or you could say 25 cubic centimeters. 25 cm cubed or 25 cc's. 25 milliliters. It's the same thing. It's a unit of volume. I would expect that. Why? Because it's length times length times length. That's what cubic centimeters represents, right? A length times a length times a length. I'd have to have three length units in order to get cub cubic centimeters. So how much volume it takes up. In the same way this book is a length times a length of a length, which tells me how much volume it takes up, how much space it takes up in air. So a cubic centimeter is the same as a milliliter, same as a cc. Three different ways of saying the same thing. A milliliter is one one thousandth of a liter. So there's a thousand milliliters or a thousand cubic centimeters or a thousand cc's, all the same thing, in a liter. Let's see if we have a larger one. Example 1, 4, and I'm not going to walk through it, but example 1, 4 talks about computing a volume by using 1.1 inches, 3.2 inches, and 4.6 inches to describe the sides of a box. In other words, you take a box, you measure its width, its height, and its depth in inches. You can set up the problem and compute that it's going to be 16.192 inches, but then on the other side, they're going to convert that to liters. I've got a unit of distance cubed, which is a volume, now let me convert, convert that to liters, which is also a volume. So that's kind of moving from one scale, one system to the other system, between English, which would be cubic inches, over to liters, which would be metric or cubic, uh, some form of cubic milliliters, or number of cubic milliliters. <sighs> Tell you what, I'm seeing the general angst in the eyes out there. What does that mean? When I said that, I'm sorry, the angst. Some of you all are going, oh, this is hard. No. Um, it is because it's new and you're unfamiliar with it, probably. The concepts aren't new, but you know, understanding, understanding the applications of the, some of these concepts are new. You know what? And, and I'm excited because you're not really learning until stuff is hard. You know that, right? You're learning right now, and the fact that you're looking at me going, oh, means I'm not asking you, do you know what comes after D in the alphabet? Because I could make life very comfortable for you right now, say, okay, we're going to have a quiz. Write out the alphabet. And write your numbers between 1 and 25. And you'll get 100 if you get them all right. And you'll be, hey, I got 100 in chemistry today. For what? Kindergarten, you know, stuff. But you're sitting here going, Mr. Baker, this is hard. I'm like, yeah, cool, right? We're learning. We're not just doing the stuff you already know. We're doing the stuff that you're stretching a little bit. And frankly, if you go home at night and you, every night you go home and do work and it's easy, you should be in the next class. You should always try to push yourself to be in a place where what you're covering is a stretch for you. If it's easy and doable, you're, you're cutting yourself short. And the fact that some of you now are going, ah, this is, I gotta think in this class. Cool. For some of you, it's a new experience, I understand. <laughs> For others of you, you're realizing, hey, this is a place where you need to go. This is where you need to be. And it doesn't really end. I mean, you know, frankly, and I'll just be vulnerable with you for a minute. You know, if I share it from my heart, maybe you'll share. Okay, anyway. Um, I'm in a doctoral program right now, and at the end of the month last month, I had a professor turn back a paper I turned in and said, here, try again. I've never had that happen to me in my life. I worked two months on that paper, and he said, nice try, come up with a new outline and do it over. And it's due this Friday. 
So I, I spent two months on it, and it wasn't good enough, and I have had one month to rewrite it to make it good enough. And I'm nervous about it. I've been working, how, how many hours have I worked on this paper? Crazy amounts of hours on this paper. I mean, it's, it's only like 20 pages long, but I'm pouring everything I have into it. And I don't know how I'm going to do, frankly. I, ha I have a little bit of self-doubt, you know. I've never been in a place where I've had a professor say, not good enough. Now, that might sound arrogant, but it just has never happened to me before. So now I'm, I'm questioning myself. Do I really know what I'm talking about? Do I, am I really trying hard enough? And part of me, as the geeky student that I am, I'm like, I've probably studied more than anybody else in my class, I've done more original work than anybody else in my class, because I've never been in this place before, and I'm scrambling to try to make sure that I do a good job. And you know what? When it's all over with, this is a good place for me to be. If I were paying seven or $800 a month to get a degree that I could have done without trying, why is it, why does it matter? If I, if I go to get a degree and we only cover stuff I already know and I don't have to try, it's not worth anything. And so for the amount, I want to encourage you to say that for the amount that you're sitting here now going, oh man, I don't get it, that's good. To the degree you're sitting here going, I don't get it and I need to apply myself to get it, that's noteworthy, that's respectable. To the degree you're going, this is hard and I'm not going to get it so I'm not going to try, trust me, it'll reflect. Okay? This, <laughs> sorry Savannah, Savannah's so sick of these. <laughs> But the purpose of this class is not for you to learn, primarily is not for you to learn chemistry. You say, but wait, it's a chemistry class. Okay, this is not primarily for you to learn chemistry. This is primarily for you to learn how to learn. My purpose here is to help you learn how to learn. And in learning how to learn, we're going to use that effort in chemistry. Chemistry is the subject. The real thing is to get you to learn how to learn. Do you understand how you learn best? Do you know enough about yourself to know what you need to do to learn? Have you been to the place where it's been hard and you've overcome it and you figured out, okay, I need to sit on this side of the room. I need to sit near these people and away from those people. I need to read this much at night. I need to do it before I go to bed and not pull an all nighter. I need to sleep on it. Or do you need to get up early and do it before class? Have you learned enough about yourself? Are you a, are you a visual learner? Are you an auditory learner? Are you a kinesthetic learner? What is your primary learning style? Do you learn best by seeing it, by hearing it, or by doing it? And if I were to put, give you a quiz right now and say, describe your learning style, could you pass the quiz? Because there's no right answer. You've got to tell me about yourself. Okay? And for example, it's about learning through personal initiative. Where is your primary source to find out what's expected of you for this class? Quiz question, anybody. Where, if you say, what's the homework for tomorrow, where should you go? I now. Everything's on I now. The lesson plans are on I now. The quizzes and what they cover, it's on I now. So if you're not in I now, you're cutting yourself short because you don't know what's coming up. Because the lesson plans are there. What I plan to do is in there. The homework for the night before class, it's in there. When the quizzes, it's in there. When the tests, it's in there. So if you're not checking that, you're cutting yourself short, not me. I'm not cutting you short. You're cutting yourself short. That's where you need to go. And I know some people have asked me for prints of the syllabus again. I'm kind of resisting that because I want to make sure that you all are getting into I now. Because in the past, my first year teaching, I, I placated the students all over the place. But I get my reminders through the Remind app. Okay, I'll be on the Remind app. Oh, I'm supposed to be using I now. Okay, I now. Can you just email it to me? So I would email everybody, put it on the Remind app, put it on I now, and guess what? I still heard the, but I didn't know. Why? Because I was absent. You don't need to be present to know what's expected. It's in I now. So if you're absent, you come in the next day, you still should know what the lesson plan is for the day. You still should have been doing the right reading. Why? Because you have access to that anytime you have access to the internet. So I encourage you, go into I now. Show that you can get into I now. Go into I now and look and see what the plan is for tomorrow. Maybe I'll post something to say, hey, when you come into class tomorrow, give me a piece of paper with your name on it. It'll be worth a quiz. It'll be an I now. So I'm not saying I did that. I'm just saying we should, I should be able to do, to do those kind of things. All right? So I want to encourage you as you see here going, ah, is, are my ears smoking? 
Um, for some of you, yeah, metaphorically they are. I can see it in your eyes, not through your ears. But I think it's good. I think it's a good place to be. I think it's good for you and it's good for me too because it helps me to know how to teach you better. And I'm learning each one of you on what resonates with you and what doesn't. I use the nonverbal communication all the time that I get from you. Sometimes I'll repeat something and there'll be people in here that go, oh, again? And there are other people at the same time, at the same time going, oh good, he's doing it again. Okay? And when the majority of the class is on the again, we move on. <laughs> so if I tend to repeat things too much, it's because your peers are indicating to me that they need it. And I don't want to leave anybody intentionally behind. But again, the, the general warning, if you don't apply yourself, you will get behind. In chemistry, it's very difficult to catch back up. You need to own it from the beginning and stick with it. Do some every single day. If nothing else, to build your own confidence that you know that you know it. All right. On page 19, they show a little bit of technique. A little bit of technique on measurements. And I didn't plan ahead. I don't have a ruler with me right now, but you can see it very clearly in the text about making measurements. And this first one about making measurements talks about distance measurements and, again, uses a ruler. The same concept can be applied to any kind of measuring device. Thanks, Will. So it can be applied to any kind of measuring device. But if you had a ruler in hand, you notice that the first thing that they do here is when they go to measure this little, I suppose it's supposed to be a purple line. Measure the purple line. You notice that they don't put the purple line at the very beginning of their ruler. They don't go to the zero mark or what would be the zero mark. Rather than doing that, they start at the one. Same thing down below where they use a metric ruler. They don't start at zero centimeters, or what should be marked as zero, but they start at one. And the reason that they give is actually twofold. If you've ever had one of those old wooden rulers where the edges are kind of like chipped up and marked up and stuff like that, and it's not quite. And it used to be that the ruler went all the way at the very, very tippy point, beginning point, was the zero mark. So you drop that thing and get a little piece knocked out of it, or it gets dinged up and so the edge isn't fully there, your measurements could be off. And in the same way, these more contemporary rulers, they have their zero mark inside just a bit, and they're trying to protect that edge. But still, optically, your eye, as you look down and look at that first edge, it's difficult to align at the very beginning of something. And so it's easier if you're going to align something is to move that thing that you're measuring into another scale. In this case, they recommend you go into the full one mark, one inch or one centimeter. Now, doing that, what do you think the most common error made by students is, and by teachers is, when making a measurement using that technique? They don't take the one off and they end up being one inch or one centimeter long on all of their measurements. Okay. That's why they recommend starting at the one and getting in the habit of measuring things, reading it, and automatically subtracting one from it. So if I had a line that I were measuring in inches, and I started at the one inch mark, and at the very tail end of the object, it was at the nine inch mark, I wouldn't write down nine, I would write down eight. I would automatically subtract one hole from the measurement, whatever it is. Okay? Same way centimeters, starting at the one. If I measure it to be 17 centimeters long, or excuse me, if the, if the object ends at the 17 centimeter mark, I would write down 16 centimeters. Because by habit, I always start at the one. And you'll learn very quickly to do that. I don't know if you've ever worked in like construction, doing framing or measuring distances with a tape. What, ha what happens at the end of a tape measure? With the little metal tab that keeps it from re retracting? If that's your zero mark, what ends up happening there? Anybody use the tape measure? It gets loose at the end, right? It gets real loose. So if I'm measuring the length of a board and I use that little hook to hook on the end of the board and I pull it long and I, and I mark a distance and I cut the distance and I take the board and I go to put it in place, it's often too big. I mean, it's too firm. You've got to pound it into place. Why? You cut it too long. Why? Because the end is loose and when you put it on the board and pull it, it extends just a little bit, but that little bit is enough to throw it off, which is why those kind of tape measures are fine for framing, but they're not really good for finish work. You know, you need to do something a little bit different. But it's convenient because I can just throw the end of that hook, the, the end of that tape, the hook end of the tape around a board and walk to the other end all by myself, mark it, and cut it. So you're, 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 you're using the convenience of it, but you're not getting a real accurate mark. A better way would be to have a partner go down there, take that, line it up at the end of the board on the one mark, the one inch mark, 
for me to measure it out and go one inch beyond what my final me measurement needs to be, mark it on the board and then cut it. And then of course, you learn things like, do I take the mark or keep the mark and all that kind of stuff. But you can get a much better, more accurate measurement doing it that way. So the technique we're going to use is when measuring distances, especially with smaller distances like this with a ruler, start at the one, read across to the end of the object, read the measurement, and then subtract one from it to make sure you actually write the correct length of the object down. Now the second thing they talk about there is looking at your scale. I mean, it's really nice if you start at one and you end exactly at seven and you go at six at six inches or six centimeters, whatever. That's really convenient, but seldom does it work out exactly that way. And so what you need to do second is look at the markings between each of the units on whatever device you're using. In this case, on, this, on the uh, imperial side or the English side, looking at inches, I can see that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's 15 marks between one and two. Since there's 15 marks, how, what is the value of each distance between each mark? So if I've got one from one to two, there are 15 marks in the middle. Each mark has a value of what? Well, 15 marks represents 16 divisions, right? If I've got 15 marks, I've got 16 distances in the middle. I'll try it out here. Let's see. I'm guessing here, but let's try it. It's so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Obviously not the scale, but close. So fifteen marks between. So this space between here and here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 15 and 16. 15 marks represent 16 different divisions. There's 16 divisions in this inch, so each mark is worth 1 16th of an inch. Right. So if I have my object and I'm starting at the 1 inch mark and it ends up being right about, let's say it ends up being right here right on the 8, exactly on the 8, my value would be 8 sixteenths of an inch. What's a simplified way of writing 8 sixteenths? One half inch, right? If I ended up exactly here at 11, the value would be 11 sixteenths of an inch. Again, I started at 1, not at 0, so measuring to 11 would be 11 sixteenths of an inch. Can I simplify that? No, 11 sixteenths, that's the best I can do. So if it doesn't end exactly on the inch mark, it ends somewhere in the middle. In this case, it ends on the eight. I've got eight sixteenths or half. If it ends on the 11, I've got 11 sixteenths. But guess what? Not only does it seldom end on the inch mark, and seldom does it end on a specific individual unit mark in between, what happens when it ends Let's move it over to the left here. It's at the s between the 7 and the 8 mark. What are you going to do? How long? Say about an object that goes right here. How long is that object if it ends between the 7 and the 8? It's somewhere between. If it ends between the 7, it's 7 sixteenths. If it l landed on the 8, it would be 8 sixteenths. We know that's a half. So it's a little bit more than 7 sixteenths. It's a little bit less than 8 sixteenths. Seven point five sixteenths. Well, unfortunately, it's the English unit. We can't do that in that way. We can say, however, 7 sixteenths would be the same as 14 30 seconds, right? And 8 sixteenths would be 16 30 seconds. So what's between 14 and 16 30 seconds? 15 30 seconds, right? So we can estimate that then to be 15 30 seconds of an inch long. What we can do is always go one, we can estimate to the next level between what we can read directly off of our instrument. We can read 7 sixteenths directly. 
We can't read where it's at directly, so we need to estimate it's either going to be 7 sixteenths or it's either going to be 14 30 seconds or 7 sixteenths or 15 30 seconds. Now, now if we go to the metric system. If we had a metric ruler that we we're using, that's, this, that's what makes this so much easier because if we had in the same thing, let me erase this, and let's say that we had uh, one centimeter over to two centimeters, and we would have nine divisions in here, nine marks, excuse me, nine marks between them, making ten divisions. So each one is worth a tenth, right? So this would be in the same line over here. Let's say that we ended up being at this point here. Well, it's not a full centimeter yet, is it? Because the distance goes from one to that mark. It's not one. What's the closest whole mark we could get? Well, this would be one tenth, two tenths, three tenths, four tenths. That would be 0.4, 0 0.4. The next one would be 0 0.5. And unlike the English system where we're kind of 16, 30 seconds, 64, 128s. Here it's decimal. It's between 0.4 and 0.5. Now you can get a little bit more specific, right? If it's exactly halfway between the two, what would it be? Between 0.4 and 0.5. What's exactly halfway? 0 0.045, right? Halfway between 0.4 and point, oh, excuse me, not 0 0.45, but 0.45. 0 0.45. What's exactly halfway between 0.4 and 0.5? Well, 0.45. But what, let's say that it shades a little bit closer to the left. It's a little bit offset. It's not quite 5. It's maybe something like that. You then go in and say, I could read it if it was 0.4. And I could read it if it was 0.5. I don't have any scale between those two, but I can estimate it. If this was 0 and this was 10, where would that lay out? You could say, well, it looks to me like it's about three-tenths of the way. OK. If it's 0 0.43, if it's three-tenths of the way, right. So whatever system, whatever measuring device you're using, you measure it as precise as that device can give you, and then you estimate the next one, one more place out. Here, I could measure to the tenth, so I'm going to estimate to the hundredth. Now that's distance. The same thing applies when you're doing volumes and, and whatnot. Um, last thing we had for today to talk about was this idea of the meniscus. And the meniscus, more than just being a part of your knee, is also when we measure volumes. Let me get a little bit of water in this tube and I'll show you. You can see it, you can see it in the book, but you can also then see it as you leave. When you put volume in a graduated cylinder, here we put water in the graduated cylinder, it doesn't read it's not straight across, it's not flat. If you look inside, what happens is there's a, a tension, there's a, a force that holds the water against the sides and it causes actually a depression in the middle. Kind of looks like, maybe think of a contact, okay? The volume of water in here looks like a contact upside down. As you look from the side, look into it, you can see that the volume goes down and then back up again, like that. It's called the meniscus. You can see on page 20, they show you that when you read volumes, when you're measuring volumes in using, using a graduated cylinder, that little depression there, you measure the volume at the lowest point of the volume. As you look at the level, the lowest point of the level, that's shown on figure 1, 2 on the bottom of page 20, that's where you read the volume at. Now you might say, but wait a minute, it's higher on the sides. True, but when they put these markings on here, they already account for that. They know that when you put a volume in here, it's going to form this meniscus. They recognize that. And so even though some of it is higher, the mark you read from the bottom of the meniscus, the, the device is already calibrated to take that into account. And so in this case, this is a 25 milliliter graduated cylinder. Between each millimeter mark, there are 10 markings. So is it reasonable for me to say, right now it looks at about a little bit above 18. So I could say 18 milliliters, but that's not accurate enough. 
I could read it using the scale there. Always works better against white. 18.1, but you know what? I could read 18.1 just by looking at the scale, so I need to estimate it one more, and it's 18.13. I can go one place beyond what the scale says.